Beautiful day here in the Big Apple. We're getting up towards 80 degrees. The good weather brought to us by our next guest from the South, a hedge fund manager who made half a billion dollars on the big short. You remember the bet against the subprime mortgage market, and he believes he has found something even better. It's called Japan. He's been short the yen and the Japanese government bonds for almost three years, and his bet is finally starting to pay off big time. Is this the end of the trade or perhaps just the beginning? Let's ask him. He's Kyle Bass, managing member of Heyman Capital, with us for a Market Makers exclusive. Kyle, good to see you here in New York City. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. So, is it the end or just the beginning? You know, I actually think it's the beginning of the end. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. But how soon is the end? Uh, you know, I, when you have 20 years of post-cyclicality of thought kind of manifesting itself in the way that it has in Japan, it, it, um, it, I'm not naive enough to think I can predict uh, the end of a 70-year debt super cycle with any kind of precision. But looking at um, the changes in the qualitative perceptions of the participants is something that I think is key to this situation. And uh, we saw a big change on Friday. When you say the beginning of the end, though, what's the timing? Because we've been hearing sort of your call on Japan for a while, and it hasn't been an easy ride. Yeah, well, when I started, uh, let's say, sharing our views uh, more globally, it was uh, the middle of 2010. And I said, I said, I believe the stress was going to begin to show itself in the next three years. It's pretty much three years in, we're close, and the stress is beginning to show. Um, so, again, my, maybe that was luck uh, at the time, but when, now, now when you ask the timing, I mean, look, everyone wants the crystal ball, right? And, and again, it's really difficult to predict this, but what you can do is, is follow uh, where I think the stresses are going to show in the marketplace, but more importantly, you have to think about, you have to get into the heads of the participants because they all have a collective sense of fatalism. Like when you do the quantitative analysis here, you know they're insolvent. Everyone that owns the bonds know they're, knows they're insolvent. It's a question of how long can they hang on and what changes their views are um, a, a multitude of variables. But it's really important to follow any change in those views. And when you see things like Argentina, Greece, Cyprus, Ireland, you know, Italy, you, you see how fast things go from perfectly stable to completely unstable. Those happen very quickly. In this case, I think it'll happen even more quickly because of the 20-year buildup. But seeing that you first started talking about this in 2010, here we are three years later, how is it that you maintain, how can you still have a strong performance overall in your fund when you've got a trade that even if it's right, takes a while? So, I mean, number one, you know, I love how we refer to things as trades, right? Where when we think about the globe, I think about positioning. And I think about you can be, you know, someone, when you invest in a fiduciary like myself or someone else, you want someone that has the courage of their convictions. You want someone that's not particularly dogmatic. And if they are dogmatic, you want to think about risk management, right? So it's really important to size things properly. And uh, so far, knock on wood, we only have glass here, but let's knock on something. It, I think, Eric's head. Yeah, I think you have to be. Um, Feel free. <laughs> I think you have to be um, as thoughtful as you can possibly be on the construct of the position, uh, and and not set yourself up for many years of losses uh, until something like this. So happens. how has that worked out for you at Heyman? Because we look, for example, at JGBs. Let's take the 10-year Japanese government bond. That's actually appreciated in value over the right. past three years. The yen, on the other hand, over the past several months has fallen out of bed in a big way, right? It's now trading at 100 to the dollar or thereabouts. Right. So I can see how, you know, again, just imagining how things might be structured in your portfolio. You've made money on the end. You might have lost some on the JGBs. Is it a wash at this point, or are you... No, how, we've, how's been, it working we've been out? fortunate enough to not have it a wash. You know, we're, I'm not going to talk about um, specific um, por 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 portfolio performance on a show like this, but I'll say that it's really important, uh, again, to think about the capital at risk in your strategy and and the, the construct of how you put these kind of hedges into place. We have 90-plus percent of our money is long. It's long U.S. structured credit, it's long U.S. mortgages, it's long U.S. stocks. Uh, we have long short portfolio in equities. The majority of our capital is long. We tend to focus on a place where I spend 1% of my capital, mm. and, and that's what the whole world but wants to talk about. But this has the same kind of asymmetric opportunity that you identify with subprime. Well, it's much better than that, right? If, it, it's worse globally, if we're right. But as far as, as a fiduciary is concerned, if it happens the way that I think it's going to happen, it's, it's much more than a 300 to 1 bet. What, well, kind of, what, what, what are the odds like? They're much better than 300 to 1, right? If, like 10 times as good? 
Uh, no, no, no. So in subprime, let's say um, you could construct a portfolio where you know we thought about losing 11 percent a year and making 10 times our money. In this one, we think about kind of losing one, two percent a year in the strategy or making three or four hundred times our money. When you talk about being overall long, how important is it on the long side to be very liquid? Because as you said, things can change dramatically so quickly, whether it's Cyprus, Ireland, Portugal, Spain. So where you are long, you mentioned structured credit, but that's not a place that I think is very liquid. Well, believe it or not, it's really liquid right now, right? With Bernanke pinning rates at zero and the, the entire world continues to chase yield, you look at our indices. Our indices are being led by utilities and things that don't typically lead us into new highs. It's because of their dividend yield. So the whole world continues to chase yield. Structured credit and even mortgage credit is one of the, they're the, one of the most liquid areas in the marketplace today. People can't get enough of them. And think about it, even in subprime credit, 97% of the 20,000 lot items are still rated below investment grade. They're still junk. The ratings based buyers aren't even there yet. Like, the money is, it, yeah, it's being misallocated by the, the printing press. Well, 2013 has been a rough year for gold. Gold futures are down about 6% this year and 17 from the peak in 2011. And it is time now for gold to resume its long term upward trend. We're here for a little Futures in Focus, where we're finding you the ways to trade tomorrow's trend today. And we're going to bring in Bloomberg Industries metal and mining analyst Andrew Cosgrove and still with us, Heyman Capital Management's Kyle Bass. Andrew, let's start with you. Gold starting to hit these support levels. What's the word out there? Sure. So you have a couple factors that are supporting gold right now. You have um, economic surprises are starting to roll over and go into negative territory. Um, you have the dollar starting to hit some resistance levels that you saw back in mid-2012. And then you've had the announcements from Japan, how they're doubling their balance sheet. Um, the U.S. is still on the same kind of track with easy monetary policy. So all those kind of factors right now are still kind of filtering into, you know, layering into support for gold. Kyle, you going for gold? Yeah, you know, um, we've, we've always had a position in gold. When you think about the largest central banks in the world, they've all moved to an unlimited printing uh, ideology, right? Monetary policy happens to be the only game in town. I'm, I'm perplexed as to why gold is as low as it is, but um, I don't have a great answer for you other than you should maintain a position. George Soros told the China Morning Post either last night or the night before that he'd lost interest in gold because it, it proved in the most recent uh, I believe Cyprus episode of the European crisis not to be uh, not to perform the way that he anticipated mm. and as a result it's sort of lost its luster for him yeah well George has been a much better investor than I over the years but um, I would he's been at it for longer yeah yeah <laughs> and I I think that um, I think that it look when you think about the global monetary base uh, as Andrew just alluded to the global monetary base you know is north of 70 trillion all the gold in existence is around seven or eight trillion there might be a trillion two trillion three of investable gold uh, you know at some point in time I'd much rather own gold than paper I just don't know when that time is and you feel at all times you just have to have a presence in gold it's just a matter of listen if you're going to be if you're going to be invested across asset classes you simply need to have something there no, I just think they can't print any more of it. You know, they can make, they can mine some more, but they can't print it at the rate the central banks are printing. I just view gold as another currency. It's that simple. I don't view it as a commodity. Andrew, how do you expect gold to trade in, in the weeks and months ahead then? You know, uh, uh, on, on what basis? On the basis that it is going to be viewed once again as a substitute or perhaps even a genuine currency, uh, an inflation hedge, uh, you know, a hedge against uh, systemic risk? Right. I mean, if, if you think about inflation expectations have remained relatively anchored, if you look at five and ten year break even spreads, despite the Fed balance sheet expanding to record highs, um, you've had, as I had said before, you have these negative economic surprises filtering in. So the, the safe haven trade is kind of maybe coming back into play. From a consensus perspective, the analysts are really looking for a flat gold price over the next couple months, um, even maybe increasing. It's a seasonally stronger period that we're entering for gold right now. If too, you're thinking way. about gold as a currency and we're in this flight to quality safe haven mode, do you want to own gold rather than U.S. Treasuries? I do. But, you know, if, if, look, if something like happens in Japan like we think it's going to happen, I think U.S. Treasury nominal <laughs> yields will go negative in a flight to quality. So maybe gold moves up. Treasuries actually get a much stronger for all of the wrong reasons, not as endorsement of U.S. fiscal policy because it's the only place money has to go. But isn't the market doing well across the board for all of the wrong reasons? It's all about central bank intervention. Fundamentally, if you look at the macroeconomic environment, things look horrible. 
Yeah, I mean, look, if monetary policy is the only game in town, then we're all in for a world of trouble, and, and that's, you know, that's the way we see it. Carl, you've been long housing. It's been a great trade. Lots of other people, lots of other smart investors have uh, taken long positions in structured products and CDOs and long subprime. Uh, residential mortgage-backed securities. Absolutely, subprime. Yeah. Where do you stand on that right now? Is that trade playing out? Um, yeah, that investment is working. Um, sure did no, no, in is it, 2012. Is it, in other words, is it... <laughs> Is, is it, it played out? Out? Played out. Uh, no, not yet. I don't think so. And I, and I think the various concentric circles surrounding kind of housing not getting worse, which is how we think about it. We're not expecting it to get materially better. We're just expecting it not to get worse. Um, the services sectors, the new mortgage insurance companies, the things that are that are actually asymmetric investments you can make around the housing market not worsening are, are where the majority of um, our long side of our portfolio. And what do you think the future holds for Fannie and Freddie? Fannie and Freddie Preferreds have been a great trade over the last nine months. And I know we're not talking trade, we're talking investments, but overall, where do you think Fannie and Freddie are headed? You know, I, I have no clue. You know, it, 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 people constantly ask us about Fannie and Freddie. Um, you know, we, we, we decided to just exit uh, thinking about them when you meet with both sides of the aisle, both sides of the aisle want a bullet in their head. And typically when that happens, you get a bullet in your head. And then the second time, uh, the second thing we were thinking about, if you remember, there was a proposal to start raising the G fees. There is a way for the U.S. Treasury to get paid back all of the money that they've pumped into Fannie and Freddie if they start raising G fees. And if you remember, a member of Congress proposed increasing the G fee and not letting the money go through the estate of Fannie and Freddie, letting it go straight to Congress. Let's talk a little bit more about Fannie and Freddie. We were just beginning to get into this a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? I think when you think about the way Fannie and Freddie were put in the conservatorship, you think about the way the FDIC and, and, and let's say the Fed took down uh, troubled banks and, 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 use, and use TARP loans uh, to, to help the banks. You think about the way they, the way they took down banks uh, that, were, that were inadequately capitalized. Basically, they would, they would ask a bank to provision its losses for a year. And if, in fact, they were going to have too large of a capital hole with that provisioning, they were forcing TARP money or they were asking for TARP money, and that had a 5% coupon on it, right? It, with Fannie and Freddie, they asked them to provision for full cycle losses, and they charged them 10%. What does that tell you? Right? Even though it's a non-bank, it was the same ideology, right? They had, a, they had a bunch of bad assets on a semi-public, private institution. God knows what the structure is going to look like going forward. But they wanted to put Fannie and Freddie in the permanent penalty box. The only reason they didn't take it all the way down is they wanted to have China continue to buy our bonds. So you have this scenario now in which you, you, you put a punitive uh, tax on Fannie and Freddie you never wanted them to emerge from this quagmire that they were in. You wanted them to be restructured. I think the Treasury did. Uh, and now you have a situation where you have a new administration. You have both sides of the aisle uh, looking at this, and they don't want to enrich uh, anyone outside of getting their money paid back as, as the federal government. So it's this, like, it's not really, in my opinion, it's not an, a, an activity that, that one does as an investigation into quantitative analysis. It's how do you handicap the politics of Fannie and Freddie? And by the way, my answer is I have no idea well, how to handicap the politics. Well, how do you handicap the politics of the notion that it is part of an American's birthright to own a home? Should that be the case? We hear it from politicians. Yeah, I mean, it's our birthright to um, receive any kind of entitlements that we've been promised, I think, right? So uh, it's... I mean, come on, Stephanie. That's kind of a ridiculous <laughs> statement. I, yes, I mean, the average, the, the homeowner should go, should go um, uh, uh, buy a home, or the, the, the prospective homeowner should. Homeownership rates got to levels they've never been before under President Bush, and maybe that was too high because money was free. You know, maybe, maybe there's more of a normalized level that's lower. But should we actually believe that we're in a true housing recovery? Mm. If you look at Friday's jobs number, if you look at the participation rate and all of these people simply dropping out, should we believe that they're going to then turn around and buy new homes? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, I think that if you look at housing busts historically, there have been 23 busts since 1980. And in, in the average peak to trough timing was about six and a half years. Uh, in those associated with heavy banking crises, it was seven and a half years. And the peak in home prices was Q2 of 06. We're really kind of seven years in, which makes complete sense from a historical perspective. Peak to trough declines on average were 31 percent. Ours was 36 and a half. We've washed out our housing market. It's just going to take a long time. To recover. I just don't think it's going to get any worse from here. 
Uh, I'm not saying it's going to get materially better that we're in a boom or that all of a sudden uh, we're going back to the to the home building rate that we were at um, back in the good old days. Let's think about those people though who are dabbling in Fannie and Freddie. You did dabble for a little while. We did. And Fannie and Freddie preferreds. We did. And you're out now. But do you see a possibility that in the long run, uh, you know, the lower the lower tiers of the, of the capital structure will survive in some kind of Fannie Freddie restructuring, and that that this is actually going to be not just money good, but a money making opportunity. Yeah, I think that um, I think it, it could absolutely work. It just won't, I, my money won't be there because I don't know in the end how either side of the aisle really wants this to play out. And by the way, that's how it's going to Too play much out. Too political risk. It's going to play out with the politics, and in my opinion, not really the numbers. So who knows? I just I don't know. How about the CMBS market right now? How do you want to be there? You know, where do you want to be in CMBS? You know, we're not involved there. I think that um, anyway, I think there's some negative selection bias to what's left. What's what is able to be refinanced has been refinanced out of those portfolios. The trophy properties have always stayed trophy properties. What's left? I don't know. Could be more problematic. We don't we don't uh, traffic in the market right now. Let's go back then to residential real estate. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say that it's you know, you were just saying you don't see the housing market recovering much beyond where it is right now. You know, fine for the time being, maybe a little bit of improvement, but it's not going to be a home run long term we on the We think it'll marginally improve going forward. Why is that? Is it because, I mean, we were talking about the risks of monetary policy earlier when we were discussing Japan, and I suspect before this conversation is done today, we'll get back to Japan. But some of those risks surely present themselves here in America. The Japanese you know, are kind of copying the template laid out by the Fed. If there is as much risk in Japan by virtue of monetary policy, is there similarly not macroeconomic risk here that could revisit itself upon the housing market due to the way that the Fed is managing interest rates and quantitative easing? Yeah, I think that, so one of my uh, um, underlying beliefs is that U.S. rates can't go up for a long time. You know, Why? Bernanke says, low for a long time and then he says low for two years I think he means to say low forever as long as he can keep them there because every point of, of interest rate every full hundred basis points costs the US another hundred fifty billion dollars in interest in interest, in interest service you know payments. and think about it, I mean we can't cut a trillion dollars over ten years you can do discounted back math and say what that means is we can't really cut about eighty billion dollars a year or you know it's it's it is crazy uh, to think that we can raise rates 100, 200, 300 basis points. We may be able to ceremonially move them 25 or 50 with to try to make everyone think they're moving higher. I just I don't think we can raise rates. Well, so, we're, so we're in so therefore, forever, effectively. Right, right. And I, I don't mean to be that cynical, but no, no, you no. Know, but this is bad, my, right? My the way view, you're explaining it, view, it's just my mad. view is really simple. I just don't think we can raise rates. Therefore, I think housing will have a bid. Uh, and I think rates will stay low, and a natural healing process takes place after the flush that we've seen. If rates go higher, all bets are off, uh, from my perspective in housing. But uh, again, I had to, I had to, I had to, I guess, further communicate our beliefs that I don't think rates can go higher in the U.S. Uh, and in fact, I think they're going lower first. Uh, just because of stress somewhere else in the world. Uh, I just wanted to hit activist investing. When we look at all, when we look at what's going on with Herbalife, J.C. Penney, it's all over the place. Look at the day Bill Ackman is having. Is this the kind of investing you want to be doing? <laughs> You're like, no. no I, you know, it's it's it isn't uh, where we focus. But you know, I think if you look at the if you look at the guys that are activists like Dan Loeb and like even Ackman. His, I mean, his track record's pretty good, even though he has, you know, um, periods of time in which he does poorly. We all do poorly at some point in time. Have, have you yeah. ever found yourself in a situation where you felt as though some kind of a more activist role for Heyman could have been warranted? Yeah, I mean, no, we, so I'll give, you, I'll give you my brief history. We took an activist role in a, in a regional jet company uh, where we thought that uh, management was kind of egomaniacal and didn't want anything to change and we knew the other RJ players consolidation would be a really smart thing to do uh, from a from a synergistic perspective and we went out and took an activist role got a couple of board seats got the company put up for sale into an engaged in the sale process got a bidder uh, at much much greater than where we bought it and we had to convince the pilots union to take a 10 percent workforce reduction actually not workforce reduction work in scope reduction um, and by the way their alternative was to go the way of the dodo bird and we went in there and we tried to convince the unions that this was the best thing for them to do for their longevity 
and they looked at us like we were Martians. They voted it down. The deal blew apart. We lost money, and I said, I'm done well, with it. I'm, I'm finished with being an activist. Investor. Activism 101. Yeah, Kyle, no, that's again, that was, that was just a small example, and guys like Dan and Bill are so much better at it, and, and they're, I said, they're so much better at the governance role uh, that they take and, and improving valuation than we are.